Hello, today is July 7th, 2014. My name is Jason Ross, and today we're going to be conducting an interview with Dennis Small, the Ibero-American Chief for Executive Intelligence Review. We're going to be discussing some of the recent events that have occurred around Argentina, around the U.S. Supreme Court decision upholding the ruling that was in favor of the vulture funds of Argentina, and the overall context of the conflict between national sovereignty and control by international financial institutions, by the empire. So I'd like to start by asking Dennis if you could give us uh, an overview of what's the lay of the land, what are the events that have taken place recently regarding this vulture fund versus national sovereignty conflict, and what's going on internationally, and to put Argentina in context? Well, there's a lot of activity going on on the courts about this. In fact, today there's a meeting of the uh, Argentine economics minister, Kisilov, with the special master named by Judge Grisa to supposedly negotiate an arrangement on this. But uh, far more significant than that are the political developments on the international stage with regard to the Argentina fight, which is a much bigger fight than simply Argentina. Specifically on Thursday, on July 3rd, there was a, an emergency meeting called of the foreign ministers of the Organization of American States to discuss the Argentina case and the implications of the debt rescheduling question that came up in, their, uh, in that regard for the systemic situation of the global financial situation. Now, what came out of that meeting was a resounding vote of support for Argentina in their battle against the vulture funds because what's at stake is that you have a total financial warfare offensive against Argentina as a precedent for every nation around the world of funds that had purchased Argentine bonds at default for pennies on the dollar with the intention of going to court and suing for a hundred cents on the dollar plus plus penalties, plus interest, plus arrears, and so on. And in one case, they're talking uh, with NML Capital, which is one of these horrendous vulture funds, uh, headed by Paul Singer, who incidentally is one of the principal financiers of Republican congressional campaigns, I should add, that they were demanding what amounted to a 1,608% return on their quote-unquote investment over a five, six-year period. Now, Argentina has very rightly said, no way, this is not going to be done. Our people's development and their mere existence comes first. And they were inviting these so-called vulture funds into the debt renegotiation package, which they had arranged back in 2005 with 93% of their creditors in which a so-called haircut or write down of the debt was agreed on of about 65% write down to then pay off the new debt over time. And the argument at that time of the Argentine government of Nestor Kirchner was you can't ask a cadaver to pay a debt. We have to grow before we can pay. Now just today, uh, literally one of these cases of on my way to the studio, I learned the following, which is that according to the United Nations Economic Commission on Latin America and the Caribbean, which is a major UN body on the economy of this region, that from the period of 2002 to 2010, in other words, under this debt renegotiation regimen where growth came first, Argentina achieved the highest rate of GNP growth of any country in the region over the last 50 years. They grew at 5.6% more or less. Now this is GNP as a measure, it doesn't really measure the physical economy, but you get the idea. Without growth, you can't pay. And what the, was being demanded of them was the way you pay is with your corpse. And Argentina, unlike many other countries in Africa and elsewhere that had been subjected to the same type of treatment by the vulture funds, all under the control of the British Empire, Argentina said no, and what they got at the Organization of American States was a resounding vote of support from all of the members of the OAS, with two exceptions, the Obama government of the United States and Canada. Now, the icing on this vulture fund cake, uh, as you were just mentioning, was that the Supreme Court of the United States, just about a week or two ago, 
had found in favor of the vulture funds. In other words, the imprimatur of the highest court of the land was given to genocide against a population in backing of a global speculative bubble which has reached astronomical proportions at this point. So this was an extremely important meeting because there was this kind of uh, solidarity and support. It was also important because at the meeting the Venezuelan delegation, led by Foreign Minister Hawa, had stated that they wanted to bring to this meeting the concept of the Drago Doctrine, which is a reference to a 1902 letter written by the then Argentine Foreign Minister in defense of Venezuela, which at the time was being blockaded and shelled by gunboats of Germany, Italy, and the United Kingdom in 1902 to collect the debt. And Drago wrote a letter which came, went down in history as the Drago Doctrine, which says sovereign debt of sovereign nations cannot be collected by force. And Drago himself, in that doctrine, referred to the great Alexander Hamilton as a precedent for these kinds of ideas. And he subsequently referred to his own doctrine as a kind of financial corollary of the Monroe Doctrine, written by John Quincy Adams, which stated colonial powers such as Great Britain will not be allowed in the Americas. So for Venezuela to bring that issue before the OAS in 2014, going back 112 years, saying this is why we are today supporting Argentina, and saying it's why we supported Argentina on the Malvinas in 1982, on a doctrine from 1902 which traces back to the origins of the American Revolution now being violated by the Obama government and the Supreme Court of the United States, what this brought into that OAS meeting, I think unbeknownst to many of those talking there, was the actual power of ideas, historically moving ideas which were moving current history today. But that concept of sovereign nations and that sovereign debt cannot be collected by force under conditions of a system which is blowing out is of extreme importance to the global uh, situation today. Now, I would add, just by way of rounding out this picture of this rather extraordinary meeting, which I had the, the, uh, the honor of being able to be present at and talk to many of the principals involved, very strong solidarity for Argentina. But solidarity is not enough. They are going to lose, and the world will lose, if this stays at the level of solidarity. Because what's necessary and is a fuzzier idea among those countries and others is what is the cause of this crisis that has, that has led to this circumstance, which is not an Argentine issue, and how do you solve it? What is done? Because the cause of the problem is the blowout of the total transatlantic financial system. So the only way you are going to stop the vulture funds from preying on countries like Argentina from implementing the British Empire's bail-in policy is you have to kick over the chessboard entirely. You have to destroy the British Empire. The principal support of that is Obama in the United States right now. And you have to replace that with the kind of international financial system which Mr. LaRouche has been talking about repeatedly. So solidarity won't do it. You're going to need, in addition to that, the South American nations linking up with the motion coming from the countries in the Asia Pacific region, in particular Russia, China, and others, who incidentally will be meeting at the BRICS meeting in Brazil in just a few days on July 15th, including with Argentina and other countries. And most significantly of all, you must have a world drive immediately towards Glass-Steagall bank separation in order to destroy the entire speculative apparatus, along with the remaining points of LaRouche's four-point plan, which includes setting up a Hamiltonian National Bank with the idea of then issuing a credit system for development projects to foster the productive powers of labor, and especially keyed on fusion energy as the driver of this. That issue of Glass-Steagall, interestingly enough, also was brought to the OAS meeting. And it was brought there in two ways. First, it was brought by the foreign minister of Guyana, the acting foreign minister, uh, Robeson Ben, who in his remarks, immediately prior to the vote, called for a return to Glass-Steagall since its repeal 
had destroyed the world financial system and led to the crisis in Argentina. And he said, we South Americans must urge legislators, congressmen in the United States to reinstate Glass-Steagall. So that was one way it was brought there. The second way it was brought there was by the LaRouche movement, which outside the meeting had a banner rally where it said, LaRouche's four points, including Glass-Steagall, destroys vultures, which is true. And inside, in our discussions with uh, ministers, ambassadors, and others, we were discussing this extensively. So you have the components of something that can work to completely wipe out the British Empire if this moves in the direction which LaRouche has specified. Therefore, there are great possibilities coming from it, but this is not yet a done deal. This is a battle in progress. Right, and you brought the distinction between uh, a monetary fight or the issues of monetary policy and uh, money itself versus the issue of sovereignty. That what we're seeing is the use of money and regulations and lawsuits and control of it to effectively eliminate national sovereignty on the planet. That would be the intent of the vulture funds at this time. I was wondering if you could, uh, I've got a couple questions for you. One, I was wondering if you could talk about debt as a weapon and Mr. LaRouche's proposal some decades ago to use a debt bomb as a way of breaking free from monetary control then. Uh, let, me, let me start by asking you about that. Well, yeah, there's debt and there's debt. Um, in the case of the world financial system today, we've recently documented that total financial aggregates internationally are now zooming towards the barrier of two quadrillion dollars internationally and probably has broken through that barrier by now. These are the latest statistics of the Bank for International Settlements on what's happening with derivatives uh, as, as uh, analyzed and presented by Executive Intelligence Review. You have a growth rate of this bubble now that's going on at 20% per year, which had chilled out a little bit from the period of 2008 to 2012 under the conditions of the crisis, but now, that is now off to the races again. And it is the British Empire's effort to implement the bail-in policy of salvaging the select few large banks and financial institutions while destroying the population of the planet with austerity measures, uh, such as knocking out six out of seven billion people, which is their stated intention, which is behind things like are happening in Argentina. So those financial instruments have absolutely no standing and merit whatsoever under law. That is not legitimate debt. It is illegitimate debt. It is gambling debt. It's the same thing as betting on a horse at the, at the you know, when you go out or you go to the casino or go to Atlantic City or, or Las Vegas. Nowadays, of course, you don't have to go to Atlantic City or Las Vegas. You can just go to the corner because it's being legalized around the country. Uh, that's not a legitimate debt. What Alexander Hamilton with the debt did with the debt, which was the legitimate debt of the United States government after the Revolutionary War was to turn that into credit by assuming full responsibility for the debt which we had issued to be able to, to, to win that war. That's one thing, and that was absolutely the right thing to do. What has happened with the derivatives bubble and much of the sovereign debt of nations is that it has been paid and paid again and paid again and paid again through tricks and maneuvers uh, of what we've come to describe as banker's arithmetic. So all of that needs to be audited and then simply written off, the vast majority. So this is what Mr. LaRouche meant by the debt bomb back in 1982 when he proposed this as the way to kick over the chessboard at the time of the Malvinas War. Today, the equivalent of that debt bomb then would be Glass-Steagall because what that in fact does, if you apply the strict Roosevelt Glass-Steagall standard today, is that it completely wipes out the 90% of all of those financial aggregates, all two quadrillion of them, which are derivatives. Derivatives are nothing but bets to cover losses. That's all they are. They're not le legitimate financial obligations. So that can and must be written off. And that has been a constant policy of Mr. LaRouche's uh, going way back, because the productive physical economy is what has to actually be, be favored. Now, this is what many of the nations of Asia and the Pacific are actually doing. This is what Russia is doing. This is what China is doing. And there is a very significant amount of diplomacy scheduled for the next two weeks 
around the BRICS meeting where these issues will be on the table uh, as to how you gear a financial system to permit the development of the productive powers of labor in the respective economies. Let me ask you about the response to that then, because you mentioned a few of these things, the solidarity around Argentina, the BRICS meeting, um, the push for an Asian development bank, increasing de-dollarization of, of national deals being done in local currencies rather than through the use of the dollar. The, uh, I guess the question would be, you know, this bringing up of Glass-Steagall at the OAS, the increasing momentum for that, what's the response? How does the, how does the financial empire respond to these things? What's, where, where do they go from here? Well, they have a couple of options on this thing. One is to simply blow the world up through nuclear war. And I, I don't say that uh, lightly. Their intention under these circumstances is to initiate the kinds of wars which they have been initiating, Syria, Iraq, Ukraine, each and every one of them illegal wars initiated unconstitutionally by the Obama administration who is in the Queen's hip pocket, which is not a very pleasant place to be. Uh, but that's his choice, and that's where he's chosen to be. Now, so that is an option, to go for global warfare to try to force the Russians and the Chinese in particular to back down. The other thing on this, their other option, is to simply uh, force the, financial, the transatlantic sector to sink into financial chaos altogether. And the crucial battleground on this is the United States. Will the United States break with Obama break with this British tradition and go back to the principles on which our nation was founded as expressed by Hamilton or in Lincoln's greenback policy or the Monroe Doctrine or what Kennedy did, Roosevelt did, Glass-Steagall and what LaRouche is proposing today. If so, the United States can retake control of our own dollar. The dollar today is not controlled by the United States of America right. as a constitutional republic. The dollar is controlled by the British Empire. Just as our presidency has been taken over by the British Empire, our dollar, since the euro dollar crisis of the 70s and so on, has been taken over by the British Empire. So if we can resume control over our own dollar, which means a thorough banking reform of the United States, Glass-Steagall going back to a Hamiltonian system, Wall Street gets wiped out, tough luck, no loss to anybody but a handful of people there, most of whom are probably so high on cocaine that they won't feel the pain. Um, and then we have a situation where the United States can be the necessary partner of what's going on in the Asia Pacific region. If that does not happen, then the prospects of the world are not encouraging because Russia, China, and these countries are breaking with the dollar. They are not going to go down. And if countries simply say no, those assets go up in smoke. But if that's all that happens, we're going to have chaos and war. It is our responsibility, particularly here in the United States, to make sure that we get our country back, that we get our currency back, and no better time to do it than in these couple of days around our Independence Day. A good time to celebrate our independence from the British once again. Right, and to celebrate it, we should uh, do it. Yeah, implement it. <laughs> that's right. We better have something to actually celebrate on this thing. The uh, LaRouche summarized the situation really very straightforwardly in recent discussions that we've had with him. He said, the choice is very simple. It's Wall Street or mankind. You choose. And that's a choice that can't be made without our activity here in the United States. Well, thank you, Dennis. I think this was a very helpful discussion. And for our viewers, this is, these are exciting developments, but obviously, as Dennis has been covering, these aren't the sort of things to watch from the sidelines and cheer on and be happy about alone. We have to transform the United States and break from the British rule here, or the potential world that could come into being is not going to happen. We are faced with war as the response to the bail-in uh, situation that we're in. That's the alternative, war or mankind. So thank you for joining us and stay tuned to LaRouche Pack.